my talk today is to uh, introduce and talk about some of the work that uh, with my colleagues we've been doing along the lines of bringing computer vision to a novel class of sensor processors, what we call pixel, pixel processor arrays. And um, uh, this indeed is a collaboration with uh, a number of colleagues, mostly from the University of Bristol and Manchester. Um, and I will be presenting uh, some of the some of the things that uh, we have done uh, together on this. Um, but more information on anything that I'm going to present is going to be in our website for this project, which is project-agile.org. Okay, so let me start by talking about what the traditional vision system and vision hardware looks like. So normally we, we consider that a vision system starts with a conventional camera, like the one we have in here. A camera that was designed not necessarily for visual processing. And I think this is part of what I'm most interested in highlighting today. A camera that essentially has been um, developed for recording images. Um, not necessarily visual processing, but our standard computer vision pipelines start with exactly that. Uh, this device then sends a number of images over a channel um, through an interface. It's, it can be a firewire interface, it can be a USB interface or some other interface, but there is some translation of the images and signal and the visual signal into a, a bus an interface that sends all this data into something like a processor, perhaps again after translation uh, with an yet another interface. Uh, some of the processors that we use are insufficient for us to do some of these uh, visual tasks. So we use other processors like GPUs, which have become very popular, which of course, initially they started for graphics processing and now uh, they have expanded into AI and computer vision thanks to a number of uh, uh, tools that have been developed for that. But that is not the end of the story because even after we do all this processing and all this fairing of information, then we send this to uh, perhaps a microcontroller that is then sending again these this, um, uh, more direct commands through a, a motor controller and finally we reach an actuator. So I, I'm sure I'm not describing anything new to anyone here because you will all be familiar with this uh, thing that we have um, become to get used to expect in a visual processing. But I think the question to us is, does it actually have to be like that? Do we actually have to do all these different um, uh, jumps and translations of data uh, before we actually can, can do action based on what we are perceiving? And uh, this is precisely what a pixel processor array is meant to alleviate, where we want to go from uh, the visual perception to much closer to action, perhaps even directly to something like a servo motor. And uh, if we can do this, then what we can expect uh, our system is going to be able to, to do is you, you will be having several gains. Let's say energy consumption will be one, because if you compare a system like this, even if you are not talking about any specific details, you can already um, uh, presume that the num number of components that are involved already are going to help you uh, from the point of view of energy consumption and latency, uh, which of course is very crucial for agile uh, systems uh, uh, that need to navigate and respond autonomously. And overall, we, you will be reducing system complexity. Of course, there will be challenges if if you implement a system with this, but these gains can be quite substantive uh, for uh, especially future uh, systems that we want to enable with vision. So is this something new? Is this a new idea? It, it is not. And uh, all, although I am not here uh, necessarily going to say that um, nature is is the best way to solve problems, because I don't think so. I, I do consider my, myself a scientist and, a, and an engineer. So I do believe we can do better uh, than what is already out there in nature. Um, however, it's important to, uh, to 
to borrow some inspiration from time to time. And specifically, uh, there is this work that um, was published back in 1959 that tried to study um, what the retina in the eye of frogs actually does. This is the work of Ledvin, Maturana, uh, McCulloch, and Pitts, uh, uh, very significant names in the physiology literature, which uh, they, they published this paper. And what they described is that um, they, they observed that the eyes of frogs uh, do many things, but one of the things that, that they do is they don't just uh, passively capture information or process images in the same way as we normally expect to think uh, a system processes information. They do detect motion. Essentially, a frog can, can starve to death in so even if it is surrounded by food, if nothing nothing moves, so the, something has to move in order to actually activate this uh, this expensive part of 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 the processing, which is the visual processing. But beyond that, beyond just the detection of motion, they also identify what, in very colloquial terms, they described as bug detectors. So these are actually cells in the retina that respond to small dark objects that enter the visual field, stop, and move intermittently. So it's not just that they are detecting something that, that, that has a specific size and, and contrast against the background. Um, these cells in the retina, we're not, not reaching the brain at all. These cells in the retina already have uh, the ability of processing information even that is temporal and that it has to behave in a specific way. So this is, this, this is fascinating. Um, and uh, of course, why does a frog need to do something like this? Because it wants to detect um, uh, detect uh, its food. By the way, this is a frog that my seven-year-old just drew uh, for me. Um, when Ledvin and, uh, and his team tried to publish this paper back in 59, uh, anecdotally, they described that they were laughed at conferences in physiology because the assumption then, and to a great degree today, is that the eye is only there to capture information, maybe in a one-to-one -one, uh, fashion from what is perceived to what the brain is, is going to receive. And this research and many others uh, have challenged uh, uh, that assumption. However, in our artificial systems, we still have this notion that the camera is an, is equivalent of an eye, and the camera needs to capture frames, and the frames need to be sent, uh, perhaps compressed to the brain, and the brain is where everything happens. I think th this is falling apart uh, if we really want to take the next step. Uh, from the point of view of the evolution of autonomous vehicles of many different shapes. Um, okay, so hopefully this is making sense from the point of view of motivation. And of course, there have been several systems out there that have been proposed that essentially try to argue for a change in this in this conventional view of the visual pro uh, processing pipeline. And uh, you might have come across these are uh, more common or that they have become more common in recent years, like event cameras or the DVS type of, of, of camera uh, that uh, is even commercially available nowadays. Um, however, uh, I have to say that even this, this device, these systems that essentially don't sell, they do not send frames uh, out of them, they essentially just send uh, events, which is uh, an event is like the change of brightness in a pixel, and they only send all pixels that have a change in brightness, and that's the only thing that goes out to the device. Even those devices are not necessarily what you might require in order to do visual processing, but it's already um, a way to challenge um, uh, these assumptions that we uh, usually uh, have. Um, and, and the question is, can we do more? Can we do more? than just uh, uh, detecting a uh, change in brightness. And precisely the pixel processor arrays um, um, are devices that essentially aim to 
uh, to do much more than that. But with a pixel processor array, as we will describe in a moment, essentially you can have uh, something close to what um, event cameras do, but you, you can do many more things. You can do high level um, uh, and low level uh, visual processing tasks, as we will describe, perhaps even things like deep learning on them. So what is a pixel processor array? And in this case, I am describing the work of my colleague, uh, Piotr Dudek and his team at Manchester University. Our project uh, Agile is essentially a, col a collaboration between the University of Bristol and his team in Manchester. And uh, his team for a number of years, more than 20 years, he has been working on this type of, of device where every pixel, has the light capturing capability, but it also has processing. It actually has a CPU, a very basic CPU, it's an analog CPU, with a, but it's a working CPU where you have digital and analog registers, flags and an ALU um, that allows to do processing at the time you are capturing the visual signal. And uh, Beyond that, uh, you can also communicate with the, with the neighbors. So essentially what you're talking about uh, here is uh, imagine in very basic terms that you can combine the best of a GPU, the best of a visual sensor, and, and you put them together and you kind of start processing visual signals at the image plane. And uh, this obviously um, brings a lot of benefits for uh, for any visual pipeline that wants to be efficient in terms of um, data uh, uh, sharing, in terms of energy consumption, in terms of latency and processing in general. So th this concept is a very, very interesting and powerful uh, device, which is much closer to what um, we as uh, vision, uh, vision scientists may, may want to have. Uh, from the point of view of, of developing systems that are much more efficient. How, how does a um, uh, pixel processor array actually works? Uh, well, what you have is you have an image plane, which is this uh, pixel plane in here, but because every pixel has um, access to an array, you can essentially think that you have copies of, of, of these arrays organized as if they were image locations um, where you can do things like, uh, let's say you have these different uh, arrays here with these uh, names in there. You can do uh, add array B to C and put it in A, uh, move array A, A uh, towards the east so you can do a shift of the entire array in parallel and put the result in array D and then combine D with A and put the result in, in another register. So essentially you can think of this as a way in which you directly and in parallel kind of start capturing information and processing information and sharing it with, with the neighbors and, and do a lot of things already at the point of image capture. And then you have other things like flags and input and, uh, and output um, uh, interfaces in there. And I, this is a simplification because the actual uh, pixel processor array that uh, my colleagues in Manchester develop have, have both digital and analog registers. So you can actually store like a charge in there and you can process an analog signal, um, uh, not just a digital signal. So which is also fascinating. So in more specific detail, what you see a, in a PPA, uh, specifically the architecture that uh, is called the SCAMP5, um, you, you have a number of, of pixels. In this case, you have 256 times 256 sensors um, with processors, each of them. And you can do things like randomly accessing one of these uh, pixels to make a measurement. You can also do things like global sums that are defined by a region that you determine, or you can have these uh, sub-regions that you can also um, do global sums, um, uh, which later you will see how we can use that for, uh, for deep learning and so on. Or you can do things like um, activate a, 
uh, something with, uh, with, with the value of, of a specific pixel, perhaps similar to the event type cameras. So you, you can do a lot of basic things uh, that we normally will consider uh, essential for any type of uh, 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 computation, which involves um, uh, basic operations, shifting of results, and, and uh, input and output. So it's a fairly complete thing, which also um, let me emphasize that uh, an architecture like this is a general purpose architecture. So it's not a dedicated chip that only does one thing and you cannot change it. This is a general architecture that allows you to program, that allows you to reconfigure sometimes in flight the, 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 the program that is running in parallel. So it's a very, very generic general architecture that is designed for visual processing. So what kind of things you can do with this? Well, um, we, we have been doing quite a number of things from low level things like uh, detecting uh, corners or, or salient features, edge detection, uh, also high dynamic range in real time, uh, computing optic flow, uh, visual geometry, and many of the things that I will illustrate in a moment, um, which hopefully give um, enough uh, idea of, of the power of these devices. But uh, one uh, illustration of this is, is this work with um, uh, Yan and Lu, uh, Lu uh, that, um, let me optimize for, for video, that is about an agile car that is exploring the world and in this case is recognizing uh, specific targets, in this case, <laughs> Sorry, I will. And specific targets, which in this case are gates through which it has to go through. And there is clutter there. There are other gates with different patterns, even if it is moving fast, is actually uh, able to detect these, uh, these specific gates. And by the way, this is not the view from the SCAMP. The view from the SCAMP is, um, is not recorded. Um, uh, actually, this device is not designed uh, for recording images. So. Um, uh, figured out is is kind of uh, an unknown, um, uh, sorry, unheard concept. A camera that does not actually record images, um, but in this case, it's it's acting based on the visual information. So this this visual information in this case in the, in the last bit. So is is the, is the car moving at three point eight meters per second, which for a small car, as you can see from the from the onboard image is quite fast. And depending on the pattern that is in there, it's, it's going left or right um, uh, in a type of slalom type uh, activity. So yeah, um, as I said, uh, we don't record images. Actually, in all our papers, pretty much, we have to say, uh, because our, our sponsor, EPSRC in the UK, encourages uh, us to uh, capture all the data and share all the data. Well, actually, we can't. In this in this type of device, we do not want to record. Uh, we can record, and we record some some images um, at the price of of slowing down the processing. Sometimes we we have to do that. But in general, we do not want to record images. We want to act uh, based on what is there, which of course uh, is very interesting, also for privacy uh, reasons and so on. So th this is the type of thing that, that you can do. Uh, we have also done other things like detecting um, uh, specific targets. Uh, I'm just going down through some very basic um, uh, things that, that we have developed. So in this case, we, we have a car that is controlled by a chaotic trajectory. So we cannot predict, the, the vehicle in principle cannot predict when it's going to reverse and so on. Uh, and there is a, a drone that is, that is following this car that has this specific pattern and all, everything is, is working uh, on board. Uh, in there. So th this was a, a basic demonstration we did back in 2017. There is an IROS paper uh, that talks about that. Um, the the uh, target detection is, is happening at more than a thousand hertz, uh, which in this case, we're not really exploiting given the, the speed that you saw on the drone and the car. But uh, we can do other things uh, that include things like a visual gyroscope. So what you can see here is we can collect images uh, and because we can process and, and capture these images very fast, um, we can actually use them as references. So as the camera is moving and capturing more images, we can use these 
as a way of a visual gyroscope that uh, that is allowing us to compute uh, the the uh, relative orientation uh, with respect to the scene. Um, we can do things like HDR. So a normal camera will struggle to see when when you have a lot of illumination, but because in this cam we can actually um, let me also uh, remove the optimization for video. Um, hopefully this is looking better. So uh, I was just saying that with 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 a uh, with a device like this, we can actually um, capture um, images in HDR, and we we have algorithms that uh, in much much faster than thirty frames per second, like a thousand hertz per hertz, we can start uh, uh, computing. Of course, depending on the on the exposure that you want, uh, which is going to limit how fast you can do HDR, but we can do HDR on the device. Uh, we have even connected uh, the scam to uh, an IMU in order to uh, to know what's the orientation with respect to the to 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 the floor, and based on that, we can correct emissions. So th th there are lots of things that that we can do. But one of the one of the things that we did recently, uh, well, uh, back in 2017, there is an ICC paper is how to how to compute visual odometry with this and. Um, let me share that one of the challenges that my team, which is in charge of the computer vision um, of this project, um, we have faced, one of the challenges we have faced is that we need to really rethink how to develop computer vision for this type of device. Because if you're coming from traditional computer vision, either even from deep learning or from, uh, or from the more traditional uh, feature type uh, computer vision that uh, was in use not many years ago. Um, when you have the capability of doing things super fast and in parallel, many of these algorithms actually break, and they are not actually the best way in which you can in which you can do things. So one of the one of the things that we did for ICCV in 2017 is super simple. We capture an image, an HDR image. Uh, of, of a scene, and then we produce synthetic um, uh, shifts and transformations, which we can move it left, right, and so on, and, and scale as well. And then, because we can do this very quickly, we match the incoming image with one of these distortions. And that's it. Uh, based on that, we can we can make decisions about the camera's rotating, the camera is advancing, the camera is going back, and with that we can have an estimate on on the visual odometry. So this is this is what we did for ICCV uh, 2017. Let me also optimize for video. Uh, by the way, uh, if one of the hosts can let me know if I forget to change from one way or the other in case the slides are looking bad i will appreciate that please feel free to interrupt thank you but let me play this video um which essentially is is that work on 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 this camp i will not play the, the full video um i um i will go to the visual odometry bit um which is here so essentially uh, a person is walking around, moving in a in an environment. Um, the the scamp, the PPA is is making this computation based on very basic assumptions, as I just described, in terms of the of the camera uh, motion uh, based on the images. And just by comparing images at very high frame rates, uh, we're able to to have a visual odometry that is very acceptable. Um, and this, this of course, can be enhanced with a number of, of modifications. Okay, let me go back. Yeah. So, yeah, visual geometry is is one interesting thing. Uh, another thing that we we have done is is we have uh, put this on 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 flying drones, and uh, one of the things we we have also tested is this. Um, uh, race type uh, environment where we have gates. This is inspired by some of the IROS 2018 and, and subsequent uh, uh, competitions on, on drones flying. Uh, 
And uh, essentially what you have is an environment, in this case, it's actually a, a small environment, which actually brings a lot of challenges from the point of view, not, not just the velocity, but the acceleration, because you have to decelerate very fast and then you have to move again very fast. So that is actually one of the biggest challenges on, on doing this rather than the actual task uh, of detecting these, these gates and so on. But um, yeah, we have uh, we have tested uh, within a Vicon environment for sensing and also for geofencing. So the the Vicon essentially uh, the motion capture allows us to 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 control um, uh, this uh, this drone in a safe environment, and uh, so it moves around this path that we have specified and. Uh, and, and that was a, a run with with Bicon, but um, what what we want and we have we have done is is to do this with the processing on board. And so what we have here is the 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 Scamp Five PPA um, trying to resolve where to go next. And of course, in in a situation like this, then you can have visual clutter from other gates or from things in the ceiling. Uh, and things in the environment that uh, pose challenges for how to process um, how to process these uh, signals. And uh, yeah, let me go here. So essentially, this is um, this is the way in which we are connecting for this specific test. So what you can see here is the scamp, the scamp that 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 has uh, the, all these processors per pixel. Uh, in a relatively small drone, uh, we have the motion capture in there. Uh, we also have a small computer here, an Odroid computer, which was put there mostly for simplifying development. Uh, this this uh, computer is not doing anything fancy. Um, it's just uh, doing a very basic state estimation there. Um, and then we send the data that is essentially coming from the SCAMP. So the SCAMP essentially decides, here's the, here's the next gate, this is the orientation of the gate, and this is where you have to go. So this is what you have to target, uh, uh, it tells the controller. And that information is put into, into the flight controller for controlling the actual, the actual motors, and, and that moves the, uh, the quadcopter uh, in there. And uh, the type of vision that we're doing here, again, uh, is very simple, is, is based on, on uh, filling uh, and segmentation, uh, where we can make decisions on the geometry of corners. Let's say you have, you have multiple gates through which the drone can go, um, and it makes very basic decisions on the actual scamp. So think about the frog again, I will repeat that. Uh, several times. So just very basic decisions, but happening at the image capture place. Um, and it's possible to make a decision based on the geometry of the corners um, and this information that, that, that is here uh, in order to decide which one is a gate that, uh, that, that is the one that needs to be targeted for the, for the flight controller. So out of this box, a lot of high level information is, is coming out. No need to be sending full images where you will be just wasting a lot of information. If if this image was not what you are seeing here, um, uh, and actually just the, the location of, of the gate um, and its orientation, then you will be wasting a lot of information just sending a raw image that is absolutely unnecessary to have. So, um, what 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 happens here is we have the, the the scamp, the location of the gates, and let me also clarify that in this particular instance, um, this this is like a competition uh, set up. Uh, we we haven't competed. We actually decided uh, uh, not to spend the time on that, but we we wanted to demonstrate what it could could be. Um, if, if we have a configuration where we have known gates, so we roughly know where they are, we don't know exactly where they are, so there is uncertainty in them, and, and the uh, visual processing has to make that final refinement of where the exact gate is. So this is a way in which we can combine information. Sorry, let me uh, optimize for video again, um, and let me start again. So what we have here is 
is uh, the drone. So this is a visualization of the actual flight where uh, you see these gates are um, refined. So the, the system has a notion of where they might be, but until the drone actually sees the gate, it can actually refine the precise location of that gate and it can then commit and, and go through uh, the center of the gate. That's that's the target of this um, of this controller that is implemented here. So as I said, a, a nice way in which we can also try to combine um, uh, partial uh, information and then refinement based on the on the visual processing. So the way in which this looks, this is this is an actual uh, video. I believe I'm still optimized for video. Great. Um, so what we have here, this is a paper from IMAV 2019 um, that we have. So this is the, the actual drone uh, detecting this gaze. As you can see, the acceleration that is experienced is quite significant. Um, in some places, the, the drone uh, may even lose uh, track of where the gate is, but because um, uh, you also have the, the IMU that uh, that can that can tell you that that you have just gone over what you expected. Um, you can correct that, but uh, very fast is able to make decisions about where the gates are and ignore a lot of the other clutter that is there. These images that you can see here uh, on the left are actually images that we have recorded uh, from from this camp. I mentioned before we in general don't record, but sometimes we we actually have to record in order to be able to show uh, you what uh, what is happening. Okay, so um, uh, we we have extended the complexity uh, in one other dimension, which is now the gates are not only uncertain in, in terms of where they are, but they may also be moving. So you can have a moving gate um, that uh, that is is in there, and uh, the actual video of that is here where it's a very similar setup, but now the gate, the final gate is moving and the, and the drone actually has to, uh, has to detect uh, where it is, react to it, and, uh, and then go through it. And uh, yeah, um, so this is kind of early work on, on um, fast reactions like that. All right. So um, I have talked about uh, many of the methods that that we have found very useful. Some of them super simple, like comparing to HDR edge images or performing some fill and flow type of, of algorithms in order to detect some features in the world uh, in order to simplify the vision, but also uh, be able to do it in parallel and so on and benefit from, from, from SCAP. But um, uh, we will be uh, not, uh, not uh, making enough progress, I think, if we do not demonstrate and capture with, um, with the pixel processor arrays, the, uh, their potential ability of also helping uh, the, the current uh, efforts that are happening with significant and very interesting results in the deep learning literature. And if you remember from the way in which I explained the pixel processor array works, even if it is not particularly designed for deep learning or convolutional networks, there are many elements in there. The, the, the fact that you have all these distributed um, processors working in parallel uh, and all these registers, uh, they, they are uh, quite amenable to be able to process uh, the type uh, of information that may be required uh, for a deep network. They are not specifically designed by that, but for, for, they are not designed for, for deep learning. Uh, I think this is actually one of the next iterations that I think in, in this direction of work will be very interesting to take. But uh, the fact that they are general and they 
possess these uh, various capabilities like the parallel processing allow you to consider their use for deep learning. And this is precisely what we have demonstrated in some uh, uh, recent papers. So this is uh, ICCV 2019. This is when we uh, developed our first uh, deep learning um, demonstration on SCAMP. This paper presents a method for conducting this with an inference. Lori Boss, uh, mostly process. leading this work. Uh, and that I'm presenting here in ICCV 2017. Pixel process arrays are visual sensors in which processing and memory are embedded into every pixel. We make use of the SCAMP5 system as seen here performing digit classification with an MNIST trained CNN. All image convolutions and max pooling are conducted directly upon the focal plane of the sensor itself. The networks used consist here we see such a net location uh, and another 24 on the simulated task of locating the car. Yeah, this is this is a different SCAMP. task, uh, detecting detecting a, a car in a cluttered environment. In this task, uh, the funnel output there consists of 20 neurons for possible X locations and another 20 for Y locations. The indices of the highest activation neurons in these groups then form the estimated position of the car. Here we see such a network running upon the SCUMP5 PPA. The activations of neurons associated with X locations are drawn horizontally, and those associated with Y locations are drawn vertically, along the sides of the camera image. The estimated position of the car according to these activations is indicated by the white square. Uh, okay, so yeah, so we, we have started uh, putting this, uh, uh, this type of um, architectures, uh, the deep network architectures and CNNs uh, mostly into, into SCAMP. Um, and uh, uh, I will refer you to the actual publications for details, but I will give a brief overview um, on how uh, this works. Uh, th this diagram actually is from Yanan uh, Yanan Liu BMC 2020 paper, um, where what we have is, uh, it's essentially an image that is captured. Uh, this image is replicated in order to benefit from the parallel nature of the PPA, and then uh, multiplied with kernels, uh, where we can perform, uh, therefore, a convolution. And then we can, um, have uh, implement activation functions and max pooling that uh, eventually leads to the multiplication with with a fully connected layer that, that has its weight uh, uh, encoded also in an register before we can actually um, uh, do a final classification. So essentially we're able to put with, within the pixel processor array um, a CNN where essentially all the key components of the CNN are working on the pixel processor array. So uh, no other thing is, is required. And uh, when you do this, and depending on the number of classes and some of the things that, um, that we have to deal uh, when implementing uh, the CNNs, we have demonstrated even up to 17,000 uh, uh, frames per second of processing uh, for, C for a CNN on a PPA. And uh, I haven't spoken about power consumption, but I think this, this will be another uh, uh, aspect, significant aspect to, to talk about. The current uh, SCAMP hardware is implemented with very old technology. It's implemented as a research prototype. Um, and the co power consumption is around two watts uh, tops. And uh, a lot of that has to do with the USB and other interfaces. So there is a significant um, room for improvement, but even, uh, even with the current implementation, which is by no means efficient from that point of view, you can see substantive uh, power consumption reductions uh, compared to uh, alternative systems or at least alternative uh, visual processing pipelines. So uh, let me just go into uh, briefly into very uh, basic details. I will suggest that you have a look at uh, either our BMBC 2020 paper or our ECCV 2020 paper. They talk about uh, related methods. One uh, is is uh, is more in depth in terms of the uh, implementation of the CNNs, and the other one is more towards how to do this for very fast uh, implementations, which is the one that uh, Yan and Liu um, uh, 
uh, one of my students uh, developed uh, for PMC 2020. So essentially what you have, you have an image patch and you can have your, your kernels um, that are all um, replicated in parallel uh, in here and they are copied into a 64 kernel filter. And essentially what you have, you have your filters in a four by four, in this case, a four by four, uh, four, four by four implementation. And uh, you can essentially just in parallel multiply the input image with, with these kernels and then you get a result. And then that result, and this is a very specific way in which the BMBC paper does things, it works in, uh, it implements strides in order to speed up things. So you can, uh, you can do, uh, your shifts and summations so that you can end with a, a, a four stride um, or two stride or or, uh, or one stride, depending on, on what you want. And depending on, on the number of strides, then the speed at which you are able to process um, changes. And some tasks will require very high speeds, some others will not. So uh, there's flexibility. But in the BMC paper, uh, you can find more details about how exactly this works. But uh, as you can hopefully see, there is quite a lot of, um, uh, of parallel tasks that benefit from uh, from the PPA operation that allows us to implement um, something like like a convolutional neural network. And the same for the activation functions and the max poolings, we're able to use global sums uh, and, and things like that in order to, uh, to implement uh, uh, them. And for a fully connected layer, so essentially you you can have your weights. In this case, they, they are binary weights. We have also explored with trinary weights. We have also tested analog weights. The problem with the current implementation of analog registers in SCAMP is that they degrade very easily. So um, we actually have uh, preferred to, to implement all our CNN so far on, on binary uh, registers. But with better technology, we believe that it would be possible to even uh, reduce this, uh, this restriction that your weights have to be binary. Uh, you can uh, just hopefully use analog weights uh, uh, with, a, with a better hardware implementation. Uh, and so, so the same for, uh, for, for a fully connected layer, the way in which it is implemented actually um, ends with, with you having the results in a sort of check, check, checkered pattern that then you, you have to, uh, using some of the global sums that I shown at the beginning, you can grab all those all, all that detail um, uh, into, into the right place uh, for you to issue the, the final outcome. And as an example, uh, um, uh, this has been tested in in uh, in tasks like gesture recognition, uh, let's say this uh, uh, rock paper scissors task uh, is recognizing all on the scamp with a CNN at 8,000 frames per second, and with a latency of 121 microseconds from image capturing to classification. So 121 microseconds of processing. Uh, from everything on the image capturing to a, to a decision with a CNN on SCAP. Uh, and uh, this other video, it's, uh, it's quite uh, uh, worth showing, even if it is not uh, overly impressive in terms of the operation. But what I want to highlight here, so this does it just your uh, classification, but what I want to highlight here is this cable. This cable is showing that we can directly from SCAMP uh, uh, produce the signals that that are controlling a servo motor, which in this case is just in a in a very uh, friendly way in trying to indicate what is the gesture. Of course, there is this, this servo motor is very slow. This is not designed for uh, actually using the high speeds that, in principle, could be extracted with a device like this. But at least it's demonstrating some of the some of the important things that I was uh, trying to argue from the beginning. How can we go from perception to action pretty much straight away? And this is this is a, an early illustration of that um, of that. In some of the other cases that I have shown with the drones and so on, we had this for debugging purposes and development, like a small microcontroller in the middle that allowed us to connect things. But in principle, 
uh, there's nothing stopping you from using the onboard electronics on SCAM, which does have a very basic microcontroller in there for all the uh, for all the logistics handling in there and the interfaces to actually just connect the pixel processor array with an external device uh, like an actuator. Okay. Um, and uh, in the BMC paper, there are also uh, other interesting applications where uh, you're able to show that you can classify plankton. Plankton is is much more complex than digits and other stuff, but it's of course a very interesting and complex problem. So with um, let's say this, uh, this is actually this class and uh, it has been correctly classif classified and using a CNN that uh, we have implemented in there. Okay, so pretty much the, the, the last uh, example of applications that we have done is along the lines of robust localization on sensor. So this is very recent works. This is by Carlos, uh, by, by, sorry, by Hector uh, Castillo uh, Elizalde, who is uh, uh, just finished his MSc uh, uh, studies with, uh, with us in, in Bristol. And uh, he implemented um, uh, this uh, system. Let me also change to video. Um, where we can demonstrate that using this camp, we can uh, localize um, we can localize the, uh, the the device. Um, can I ask if you're able to hear the audio on the videos that I play? Are you able to hear the audio on the videos when I play them? Uh, not hearing it. But normally you hear, yes? In this work, we present a method of now hearing it. Thank you. Performed directly upon the focal plane of a pixel processor array sensor. A PPA sensor incorporates processing and memory into each pixel element, allowing visual data to be stored and processed on sensor. Our approach involves first capturing a visual database onto the focal plane from a sequence of select images. Each select image is encoded as a node in this database. The parallel processing of the PPA is used to directly compare each new image with every node in the database simultaneously. This comparison is used to update the weightings for each node based on the visual similarity between it and the new image. When combined with a motion model that transfers weights between nodes based on camera motion, this approach allows localization to be performed over a sequence of images, effectively by determining the best matching sequence in the database. We test our approach on a number of video datasets. Here we see the Nordland train dataset with a database of brand new descriptors generated at a different time of year than the video sequence used for testing. Despite the visual differences between seasons, our method is able to localize along many parts of the dataset. We also tested our approach on both urban and simulated video sequence datasets testing both databases constructed of binary descriptors and low resolution images. This demonstrated results comparable to similar methods while conducting all significant computation on the focal plane of the PPA sensor rather than using external hardware for this processing. Okay, so um, uh, th this is uh, early work, but essentially what is happening here is we're able to, to show that uh, uh, you can you can do localization all on the on the image plane with a PPA, and um, even some of the some of the results that we got here could be even better because when we are testing with existing data sets that we have to load into the into the into the PPA to test, we are not able to benefit from things like HDR. That in principle, when you do this live, as in one of the sequences that that we show in there. Um, will be able to help you even more. Uh, but uh, yeah, so um, uh, th this is early work. Hopefully we'll be able to, 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 uh, to present more results on, on this side. But um, just as, as a summary, essentially um, with, with a PPA, um, we have been able to demonstrate quite a number of visual processing tasks from low level things like basic segmentation and clustering of pixels to HDR images. And then uh, more um, 
high level tasks like object tracking and detection, visual odometry, and then more recently things like uh, implementation of CNNs that allow you to classify complex uh, objects and uh, even uh, the localization uh, within places. And everything within a low lag, low power consumption on a relatively lightweight module and at very high frames per second, sometimes many thousands of frames per second. So th that is like the, the summary of, hopefully you're getting an idea of, of, of what is possible to do uh, with something like a PPA. But for me, I think the most interesting thing to discuss is at least to put out there the, the, the challenge that vision uh, needs to follow the type of things that we have become accustomed to. You might remember I told the anecdotal story that uh, uh, Ledvin and, and his colleagues, they were laughed at uh, uh, physio physiology conferences because um, no one believed that the, the eye needed to or was able to do uh, processing of high level, like detecting bugs. Um, but actually there, there are elements in nature uh, that, that call us for us to consider something like that. And, and I think the, the fact that um, we're still with this notion when we build artificial systems that it has to be like that is something that hopefully we can challenge. Um, and, uh, and, and by doing that, we should be able to bring uh, potentially much better efficiency and, uh, and uh, other abilities that so far we have been unable to fulfill or we can fulfill them at a much more, much higher cost in terms of, of complexity or energy consumption and so on. So, uh, there are many uh, things that can come out of, of us trying to transition into other ways in which visual processing can, can happen. To me, one of the big open questions that um, I am very keen uh, to explore next is how to decide what processing has to happen where. Because if now we can um, open our eyes to, uh, excuse the pun, but if we can open our eyes to actually uh, consider that processing can be split along the visual uh, processing pipeline. What should happen where? What is the best way in which we can split a complex task and, and use the, the right places and the right resources to, to work with that? So with, uh, with this, I finish. And um, yeah, I'm very happy to, to hear any questions. If there is no chance for a question or, or you cannot... Um, think of a question right now, then by all means, please feel free to reach out by, by email or LinkedIn and so on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's very impressive talk. Any questions? Uh, sorry, I have two, two quick questions. Mm -hmm. um, please. Scam five, um, will there be a scam six coming up at any point in the future? Uh, actually, higher resolutions my, or... my, my colleagues in, in Manchester are working in SCAM 7. <laughs> so, okay. uh, so uh, uh, but let me, let me actually address, thank you for the question, it's very interesting. Sorry, I, I, I don't see your name, it's kind of complex to see. Yeah. But, Samir. Uh, uh, thank you, Samir. Um, I want to talk about resolution because, and please excuse me if I also use the natural example. Many animals that survive out there that do ma magical things that we can only dream autonomous vehicles or, or robots can do have extremely poor resolutions. Um, 256 by 256 is actually not far away from some of the very early visual slam systems that I worked on back in, in my PhD at the beginning uh, of the visual slam era. I had a the pleasure of working with Andrew Davison and my supervisor, David Mora, we put together some of the very early visual slam systems that were able to do uh, things that before um, uh, were not possible in terms of mapping and moving around uh, and so on. And the resolutions that we were using were not far away from the 256 by 256 images that we have here. You can do a lot of things with low resolutions. I, I will, I will, and the same for grayscales. Uh, SCAMP is actually grayscale. 
And uh, you can do a lot of things of visual processing with grayscale images and with low resolutions. So I, I do understand that there will be tasks that you will be interested in, in having higher resolutions. Sometimes that can come from the optics, uh, but sometimes you might not require a resolution. I, I don't know, I probably, and I would love to hear your view, but let me please allow me to just say that maybe our obsession with resolution has come from precisely this notion that cameras are there to record images. And for autonomous vehicles, this is just not the case. You do not need to record things, you need to act. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and therefore, uh, it would be great to hear uh, about tasks that actually require higher resolutions, but I will invite everyone to think that uh, resolution may not necessarily be uh, a limiting factor to actually do a lot of things. Um, yeah, I have a lot of questions, but I'm gonna ask one more question. Will it- Of course. Will SCAMP be available for the public to try? That, that, that's a great question. So actually one of the things that we want to do in our project, which is kind of coming to an end, uh, uh, relatively soon is we we're hoping that we will be able to to provide a scam hardware to people to start using it uh, and then my colleague um, Piotr Dudek who developed the original architecture is also considering uh, some co commercial opportunities um, so yeah watch this space in both uh, go to our project uh, page project agile.org and uh, and getting in touch in terms of of being uh, aware of when um, we uh, we can provide hopefully some power for for people to to evaluate. Uh, thank you. My pleasure. Great. Any other questions? Uh, actually, uh, actually, I have uh, several questions I uh, scanned, and the first one is about the classification. Actually, you know we. We can say, you know, I have one question. Uh, the first question is how deep can, can scan be, you know, that's a story. It's, maybe I need to say how deep can the CN be if we, we want to use scan. Actually, as I can say that for scan, we, we have to use some very shallow CNNs. So can, can we use some deeper CNNs? Um, uh, thank you for the question. Um, we are working on that. So watch this space as well. And uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're precisely starting to work on, on that. So at the moment, uh, you're quite right. The type of CNN that we're able to put in there is very, very shallow. Uh, a couple of convolutional uh, uh, layers and uh, uh, maybe one or two fully connected layers. There are ways in which you can, you can, you can change that uh, even right now. Uh, depending on the on the parameters that you have, number of classes and so on. But uh, in, in general, yeah, they are small. We're working on ways in which we can improve that. But let me also um, uh, bring back to, to this question, this, this big question that I have here. Let's imagine that, that you can put uh, dozens of, of convolution layers on, on the PPA. Maybe for some applications that will make sense, but maybe not for every ap application. Maybe the right thing is that there is this understanding about what should happen where. And I think this is this is opening as a research question, at least for me, it's a very interesting thing. If I connect this with with the natural world, uh, one of the one of the questions that I have in my mind is why do we have an optic nerve? Why did the brain, I mean, I understand the mechanics that you have a moving eye and you don't want to have a massive resolution everywhere. Um, so that already implies that we need to have a, a connection between the sensing side and more uh, uh, more complex processing side. But uh, the, the, the question here is why, why didn't the brain and the, and the eye essentially are the same? Um, th there, will be, there will be reasons why you want, want more, more processing closer to the image plane and some other tasks where you do not want that because you know it will just not be more efficient. So I think us understanding how to split this computation is indeed one of the next challenges that, that we have when we start opening the, the way in which we can build processing pipelines in this way. Okay, does, does, does that make sense? Yes, yes, thank you. And uh, actually the second question is followed by this one. Actually, uh, if we use a deeper network, so now how to implement such normalization 
but because I didn't see much normalization in your classification. How, how to implement batch normalization? Yes, yes. Did you say, ah, okay. So if I can refer you to uh, our BNBC uh, 2020 paper, there is some there, and there is some other work that Jan and uh, Liu, who I think is actually here uh, in in the workshop, uh, uh, we can walk you through some of the things that he has been doing. Okay, okay. And the last question is, you know, uh, are you thinking about some like a uh, metric, some like other applications, for example, use different animals, uh, for example, something like that. With, with UAVs, maybe we can get, get some kind of birds. Yeah. Uh, like you, the audio is not coming uh, along very well. Let me see if I understood. Did you say biometric applications? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, so actually that that's a, that's a great application uh, area, I think, especially because of the privacy. Um, essentially, you, you can imagine that you can have a device like this that essentially just say, uh, uh, this is Walterio, and, and I, I don't have to, to capture any image, or, or this person has a skin disease without actually having to capture the image of that person. So you can think on applications where you can, um, you can do things like that, that you're observing people, especially, without actually having to report uh, uh, compromising information or information that was not required. Um, I don't know if, if this is what you were thinking when that, but when I, when I think about this type of biometric applications, I do think about privacy. And I think that devices like this could actually be very interesting because you're never recording anything, but you're able to actually uh, produce a result. Mm. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Thank you.